Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Tonight, we are on episode 202, and we're going to be talking a little bit about the Bushcrafter's Forgotten Friend. The Thread Injector, the, uh, we named a few other ones here, the Fabric Welder, the Siamese Cloth Maker, Sewing Machine, whatever you want to call all these things, we're going to talk a little bit about them. Um, for me, anyway, Ben, it's one of those things, I find it really underappreciated in the bushcrafting community because they get overlooked a lot like that's not a skill set i want to learn what purpose is it going to serve me i uh i i went through the same thing um when i got into um hammock camping a lot of guys were trying to make their own tarps there was guys trying to make different things and i got interested in it and and i'd always grown up with this uh sewing machine but the second I went to buy one, everyone made fun of me. They, they said, like, oh, that's a woman's tool. That's this, that's that. And it was like, why don't you get into the, the forging and, and wood carving and all these other things? But sort of the thought to me is like, well, anything else that joins two pieces of material is a pretty manly thing, right? Like, if you can join two pieces of metal together, that's like welding and riveting. That's that's. And carving and woodworking, that's what, why is it different with claws? And we need claw for so much. Um, it's definitely underappreciated and so essential for so many things. Because you can buy expensive, you know, sewn gear, but you can't customize it really. Like you're stuck with what's what's out there. Mm. Um, and then even the gear you have, like the build, the, something like that gives you the ability to repair so much of it. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's definitely a cool skill in my opinion. No, and I couldn't agree more. And you know what? Still a little sad to say, I still get the odd jab about it. Uh, the in-laws and stuff like that to make fun of the, the sewing machine and things. But honestly, at the end of the day, um, I think they do understand why I have one. Don't get me wrong. It does. I don't take it to heart as you know. <laughs> and I wouldn't suggest anyone else out there does either. Cause honestly, these things are awesome to have like even basic sewing knowledge. And don't get me wrong. I am not good <laughs> at sewing. Uh, I do have a sewing machine. I can use it, but I am not a good sewer. I can put two pieces of material together and that's about it. I can't do it fancy. I can't do it with a specific purpose other than basically joining them. So a very entry level, but it still served me very, very well. Uh, and like I said, I tell a lot of people, if you can find one at a cheap price, and they do come up fairly often at a lot of places for decent prices, you can find them on Facebook Marketplace, Kijiji, if you have that available, Craigslist, if that's more your thing, any of those real buy, sell, trade sites, uh, even local big box stores, Walmart, Canadian Tire, and areas, they'll put them on prices, so, or they'll put them on discount sometimes for really cheap prices. And you can get a good sewing machine without, you know, breaking the bank. Now that being said uh you may not want to cheap yourself too much either because there's kind of a fine line between paying enough to get something that works good for what you're going to do and you don't pay enough and you end up with something that's going to irritate you more than anything and that was one of the lessons i learned uh going into sewing and i don't know maybe you have a, a similar story or what what was your experience getting into it <sighs> It was varied, honestly. So I, when I cho decided I wanted a sewing machine, like always, I over-researched the hell out of it. I, I had to know everything I could could know to p make the good choice. And I reached out to friends and family, and then I went on the internet and I did a lot of research. And the one I picked out, you know, on paper was the best one for me for everything I wanted. But I still struggled at the beginning because nobody really explains some of the stuff of how to use a sewing machine well. Uh, a lot of stuff, I think, is just assumed you knew. Um, so if you're going to buy a sewing machine, especially a higher-end sewing machine, there's not a lot of instructions on how to, how to properly put the thread on the bobbin and how to put the bobbin in the machine and, and, and why it's important to have which type of material where. And I still don't know it all. By no means am I an expert sewing sewer. But likewise, I can get two pieces of, of cloth to stick together fairly well now. And that's given me the ability to make a fair bit of equipment. Um, and, and so I've, I'm very appreciative of that. Um, and there's so much to it. So if, 
if you're here to thinking we're going to teach you all the secrets of how to sew, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we're still learning those ourselves. But what we will teach you is some of the things you can do with a sewing machine that you might not have thought. Uh, yeah. Or maybe you did and you thought, well, maybe it you wouldn't use it enough. Because that was one of my initial thoughts, too, was... Oh, I could get a sewing machine, but how often am I really going to use it? And the reality is I use it a lot. I just had it cracked out tonight, not only to work on a little bit of my bushcrafting gear, some of my chair bags need to be sewed up, but I sewed up a couple of my shirts, a pair of Mel's pants, a couple of the kids' toys. Like, you know what I mean? You can use this in other avenues. Once again, not very well, didn't do any of this good. This is all <laughs> stuff that we wear around the house that, you know, if it gets dirty or ripped up we're not really sad uh would i sew something like somebody's good pair of pants absolutely not i'd murder that but for just keeping basic things going that's the big thing i find myself doing more than anything like i have what i coined woods clothes uh yeah. and that's basically the clothes that i wear that i'll go out in the woods i'm not scared to get them dirty i don't care if i get balsam on them you know what i mean if i if they get destroyed i'm really not heartbroken and these are the things that they work good for me in that instance and it's pretty easy to fix a little rip in one uh for me a lot of times i split seams out i find like the the belt loop will hook on a branch or something like that and i'll end up pulling like one of the pocket seams out or something stupid like that and instead of throwing the pants away you just drive it through the sewing machine in some form of manner now i'm not saying it looks as good as it did before the seam let go it is very noticeable but functional so yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, it's it it has a has a purpose. It has a function for sure. Um, so, what what do you need to know before you get a sewing machine? I think the first thing you really need to know is what are you hoping to to do with it? Because if you just go and buy a sewing machine at the store, they're going to be pretty quick to shine, try and show you ones with all kinds of neat options and abilities and stuff. That 90% you're never going to use. Um, some of them can do uh, really fancy stuff and they, they have all kinds of like functions, but every function really adds to the price of the sewing machine. Mm. You really have to think about it. Am I going to use all these functions? And uh, one, I think it was advice my mother gave me one time. She said, like, you know, 99% of your sewing is a, is a very basic function of the sewing machine. So you don't need a lot of these extra things and they, there's things that you can break and and, and uh, not work well. So I did not look for a sewing machine that had the most functions and the most options on the, on the thing. Because honestly, I, I wasn't going to figure out how to do it. But what I did look for personally is something that could sew through anything. Yeah. And that's, and that's <laughs> where I am a little lacking with the sewing machine I have. I'm yeah. in that it's not bottom end. It's not top end. It's somewhere in between. And it does just enough that I hesitate to replace it, but it doesn't do as much as I want it to. I have a lot of difficulty when I'm getting into thicker materials. And I was hoping you'd bring this up. So keep on rolling. So the one I bought was uh, a Janome HD 1000. And I think you may have an image of it that we can flick up. But uh, it, when I was doing my research, they said that, you know, it could go through like 27 layers of denim or a actual meter stick like there's there's a video on youtube where a guy actually folds some cloth over a meter stick like a a wooden yard stick for those of you in the states and they just ran the sewing machine and they hit that yard stick and kept on going he just sewed the yard stick into the material and uh i got a kick out of it but it, it really is a more powerful sewing machine so i rarely put a piece of material in there and say, man, I'm not going to go through that. It does, right? Generally, it, it does. That doesn't mean I don't have problems because if I don't have the settings set quite right, the thread will ball up somewhere, and next thing you know, it can't pull the needle back, and I got a problem. Yeah. Um, so look for something that, that's going to do what you need to do. And like I said, don't look for all the fancy extra options and bells and whistles. It doesn't Funny need enough, to have... I have my machine here. Uh, this is the Shark. It's nothing fancy. But what Ben's talking about, is you'll see stuff like this written on the side. These yeah. are all the different stitches or functions it can do. And realistically, in this entire sewing machine, I use these two up here, A and B. A basic yeah. straight stitch and a cross stitch. And that's it. The other ones couldn't even tell you what they're for, to be honest with you. Yeah. Some of them need two needles installed in the thing. And there's, there's, there's you know, you can do a dual needle, needle setup on these things. Mine can do some of this stuff. 
basic, you know, uh, I'm looking at mine here too. Uh, I got functions A through H and in, in different lengths and a reverse button. And that's about it. That's all I have. Um, I think under A, there's a way of using it for doing buttons. Yeah, I think that's a mode on mine. But I'm going to be honest. I tried using those button settings. And anybody that's thinking, oh, I'm going to get the button settings because I'm going to sew all these buttons on. I found it really confusing. And I found it way easier to use the cross stitch to do my own buttonholes and just sew the buttons on by hand. Honestly, I just found it simpler for me anyway. Well, the button one is, is for, for, you know, you said the cross stitch to do the circle around a hole or whatever. Yeah. It's, it is what it is, right? And... I can drop the dogs and the dogs are the part that, that runs the material through and then you can kind of free float to it. And it's used for quilting more than anything, really. Uh, it's a great function. Um, I rarely use it. Uh, I'm, I'm a pretty straight stitch guy. Right? <laughs> and this is what we're saying. There is so many functions you're not going to, and maybe you will. We're not trying to deter you from it. But it's a great way to try and find something a little more cost effective. Start eliminating out some of that stuff. Because the reality is, unless you're doing sewing, you're probably not going to use them. For bushcrafting and stuff like that, like I said, two stitches. That's all mine has ever ventured to out of the five years I've owned it. Right. And you can make 90% of what you need with those two stitches. Yep. If not 100%. I've so... pretty much figured out a way to do it 100%. <laughs> Because I'm not learning the third stitch. It's nope. too much. That's the limit. Yeah, two stitches down. I was really proud of myself. So, but I mean, realistically, those are the only two stitches that do anything. The straight stitch, or A on most machines, is just that. It's a straight stitch. The cross stitch, or the B setting on most machines, it just kind of crosses back and forth. So to put two pieces of material together, straight stitch, to patch a hole... Or buying two pieces that aren't weighing on top of each other, cross stitch. That's it. That's all I am right there, man. That's my entire sewing. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. Robert's figured it out. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think the cross stitch is also useful if you're doing stretchy material because it still allows it to stretch. Yeah, and there's yeah. a different type of cross stitch, and that gets once again, there is like tons of settings out there that you can use that'll probably make things better. I'm not the guy to explain them to you, that's for sure. One tool that I kind of have an interest in, and I look it up every now and then because they're really expensive, but you can buy them, like you said, used for significantly less, is a machine called a serger. And a serger is the one that puts that that thread along the edge of a piece of material and prevents it from unraveling. And I think, and somebody will correct me, I'm sure, but I think they can even cut the material sometimes. So you, it'll cut and stitch at the same time. But I'm not sure. I've looked at them. I have an interest in them occasionally, but rarely has it been to the point where I'm going to actually buy one. Um, Just out of curiosity, is this kind of what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so anybody that's watching versus listening we just put a picture one up there serger's new to me so no it's it's, it's something I've, I've thought about a bit like it has some functionality that it would be useful you can kind of do it with a regular sewing machine but it's not as good at it that this is a machine that's meant to do like the edges and it's it's basically seals the edges of, of, of a piece of material um so if you had to cut like a wool blanket that's what you, you see on the edge that that edge mm. stitching that's what it's, it's done with generally um, you can use the cross stitch thing and there's a, there's a way of doing it with a regular sewing machine. That being said, it takes skill, something <laughs> that we lack va vastly. But so you don't, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I was going to say YouTube is a beautiful thing for this though. That's how I learned to sew for the most part. Uh, and I do see some comments flashing up here on the right. I, I'm not missing you folks. I'm just trying to figure out where to fluidly put these into there. Uh, ask your aunt about those, Ben. Redbeard oh, yeah. just said. Oh, I have plenty of ants I could ask for Redbeard, yes, and my own mother. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, from the side there, I see this coming up, is home ec classes. I remember back when I went to school, a home ec was a required class when we went into what is yeah. now called middle school, I think. Uh, and they gave you some basic sewing instructions. And aside from that, I taught myself 
pretty much exclusively from YouTube because I was like, you know what? I want to make some cases for some things. Uh, I could buy some cases, but they're not going to do exactly what I want. So I could sew together some pouches and it's going to do exactly what I want. And I have all the materials here. And if I learn to do it, I can just keep making them later on. And that was kind of where I went with getting a sewing machine, which is where I think 90% of bushcrafters are going to come from when they want this. You can make pouches for things. You can repair your tarps. You can make bigger tarps. You can sew materials onto tarps, tent additions, tie outs. These are the things that really shine with a sewing machine because to pay someone else to do it you take this into a seamstress or a tarp maker or something like that you're going to pay outrageous amounts of money yeah but you can usually get all the materials and do it yourself for a pretty significant reduction in that cost providing you get a sewing machine that has been said right from the get-go there is capable of sewing through what you want it to and that's what i had mentioned with just don't undersell yourself one too because <laughs> and I have nothing against these. Don't misunderstand. I do know someone that had basically like Barbie's first sewing machine, and that's what they were using to sew together their stuff because it was one of their kids. Technically still a sewing machine. It can join two pieces of material together. Like I said, not contesting that. Problem is, it's two pieces of material that are basically tissue paper. You know what I mean? It had no rating for going through anything. The needles were really soft. Um... And he ended up getting a lot of bent needles, if not broken needles, and the machine jamming up. And that's what you're going to run into if you're trying to send something through it. That it's just not capable of sewing. And that's kind of where I hit too. Especially when I'm sewing in like additional tie outs and I'm using the thicker wick. Because uh, I've used candle wick and stuff like that. I have to be really slow, if not turn it by hand to put each stitch in manually. Because if you try and run it through, it's just too much. It balls up and I end up breaking a needle. Yeah. So I should have upgraded a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things that was described to me is if you get like a dressmaker's type sewing machine, it's meant to use some some lighter materials. It's going to be used on, on laces and silks and and uh, tool, I think is the name they, they put on it. And this this sewing machine is really, really good for that. But then if you want to cut, you know, sew some leather might not be the right sewing machine. Now, the one I have can do light materials not as good but it can also do the leather and it can do the heavy denims and stuff and so i have tried it with some of this stuff again skill correct needles correct thread for these jobs all help for sure and that doesn't mean you're going through like quarter inch leather like you're not going through you know basically armor uh but <laughs> lighter leathers and stuff you can definitely do you can sew up you know a jacket or something um and when like I had my biker's leathers. I put a rip in one of those. I didn't try to do that at home. I went down to, to a, a cobbler and had them put it on. And, you know, they, they have a leather sewing machine and it's much better than mine. Um, cost me five bucks. It was worth it. Um, but yeah, so what, what I guess we could probably do is bring up, what are some of the things you're going to potentially really want to do? And I think the most basic thing to sew is a bag. Yep, and Red Bear Tactical said to over there, and I actually have a sample of it, which is kind of funny, is using lags off old BDU pants to make cases for things. And that was literally one of my first projects. That's the lag so off a pair of pants. Yeah. My, the, I sent you some pictures of my two uh, Agua Cannon saws. And I got them right here. Those are both sewed from a pair of pants. And I, in fact, I think I ripped the pants at work. And that night came home and sewed two, two pouches. Um, I mean, that's an excellent thing for a basic sewing machine. Mine has no problem doing this kind of stuff. No. Uh, um, sorry, go ahead. And the best way to make it look good is sew it and then turn the thing inside it. Exactly. And that's <laughs> what I was just about to say. It was The secret to making a bag is sew it from the inside. And then when you flip it out, it hides all the seams. And it can make the worst jobs look neat. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, yeah, you. I think we hit on one of the first things I really wanted to kind of get into once we got moving, and that was where do you get material? And old clothing, like we all wear out shirts, pants, stuff like that, is a great source of material. Usually with pants, there's a few spots they wear out. The legs in general are usually still good for a long time. It's the, the crotch and ass that you wear out really fast, maybe the knees, depending on what you're doing um 
so there's still a lot of good material in these things. Thrift stores. You can go to a thrift store and pick up. I was picking up leather jackets at the thrift store, especially women's leather jackets. They're selling them for dirt cheap. Bring them home, cut out all the seams and save as much leather as I can. Made leather pouches and bags. I don't know if you have any of them where you're at, but here at the Frenchies and Louis and stuff like that, they have garbage bag sales where it's you pay a flat amount and anything you can fit in a garbage bag. You know what I mean? And this isn't every day, but usually it's once a month, something like that. And you can figure out what the the timing is of that. And you just go in with a garbage bag or they give you a garbage bag now because of the variety of sizes in garbage bags. So somebody will take in a regular house bag and then somebody will take in a drum liner. So now generally they'll give you the bag and it's basically whatever you can put in that bag. And it's, you know, like a flat rate of $15, $20 or something like that. And off you go. And not only can you find some great stuff in there, great place to look for wool blankets and stuff like that at the same time, uh, you can pick up a ton of material that you can use for sewing your projects. And the way I like to do it is buy stuff that might fit me, but if it doesn't, it's now sewing material. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that way, at least I'm trying to give it a new life before I cut it up. Or sometimes, like Ben, if I see a piece of leather and I'm like, yeah, I have an idea for that, then I buy it specifically for that project. Um, yeah. So there's, you know, bags. I made bags for the, the size. Within the last little while, I made some bags for my uh, my titanium stove that I, I got last fall. And I got and that I here for you, too. So, yeah, so there's one of the pictures. That's the bag I made to hold the chimney. That's a little tight, and that holds the main stove. I put a, a little snap on it and hold it in place. Works fine for what I want it. Is it the most beautiful from a distance? Maybe. From, <laughs> from up close, you can see my airs. Uh, I, I thought a long and hard on it, and I really should have thought a little bit longer and a little bit harder. That being said, even with the issues, it's still more than functional, so I'm happy with it. Um, another thing I've made recently, just, you know, I took a wool blanket and I sewed a, um, yeah, there's the, the wool blanket, just the cheap wool blanket I got at a 100% wool at a thrift store, and I went on Amazon and I bought a piece of ripstop nylon and sewed on it and it's now a lot warmer and you can put the ripstop down and you don't have to worry about getting your blanket dirty and, and damp and it works good i took it camping a couple weekends ago you can throw it over your shoulder it keeps you nice and warm you throw it on the ground as a sit pad you can wrap it over your sleeping bag to add to warmth and i i bet you it gives you five six seven degrees additional warmth easy Oh, for sure. Like, just the wind, like, cutting that out alone, giving that extra wind block, it's just going to add a lot. I mean, it's a somewhat threadbare, like, it's, it's some type of worn wool blanket, but, I mean, it, it didn't cost me much. And it definitely makes makes a difference, right? Uh, so. Very similarly, Matt Wosley in the comments here says he uses sewing machine for sewing canvas tarps together. And that's another great project for making ground sheets or if you want to make iron skin or something like that or just a custom canvas tarp uh, yeah. to a specific size, throw it through the sewing machine. And it doesn't have to be canvas, any material. You can make custom sizes. Your imagination is literally the limit on this. Um, the same way you can build something out of metal, metal to suit your need with a welder, you can do the same thing with material uh, and a sewing machine. Yeah, no, for, uh, for sure. Um, yeah. And that's a good point, Red Bear. A grommet tool is a good add-on as materials for your sewing machine. And that's a pretty good segue into the next thing, is what do you really need to get up in sewing? Because there is a lot to it. Uh, but you don't necessarily need a lot going into it. You can get some basic stuff. Yeah, uh, mine's a hammer-on style. So you put the grommet in and then you have to tap it and it flares out. Uh, I think you might have it here. I don't know. Uh, no, it's out in the bushcrafting box. But in any case, same kind of thing. Yeah, I have, I have those for bigger ones too. And 100%, you know, you... You know, I, I think I actually used it on my bags for the saw. So here's the saw, saw bag. I put a little grommet in. I ran a piece of paracord through it. And boom, that's how I tie it on. Just fold it over and wrap a knot on it. Doesn't have to be confusing. Doesn't have to be difficult. It's quick, simple, easy. Makes me happy. Another good <laughs> thing for those grommets that people should keep in mind, drain holes. 
Because if you just cut a hole in something, it's eventually going to fray. And if you sew around it, it's a lot of work. But if you punch one of those little grommets through it, you can make a drain hole in the bottom of a waterproof bag or something like that. And if water does get in it, it can drain out. Yeah. No, no, I mean, 100%. What I've been doing with these, I actually put two grommets in. If I put one in, I put another one in. I put one in and I turn the other one 90 degrees. And I find it makes a nicer looking hole. Fair enough. So I have it went from both sides. Um, yeah, grommet tool is a good one. Being able to sew a zipper into a place, that's a that's a good skill. Um, things that you'll want to keep in hand is good scissors. Um, have a dedicated pair of scissors for your sewing kit too. I know that sounds like, oh, bougie, but honestly, it's worth it. That way you always know it's with the sewing machine and they don't get dulled up doing other stuff because a dull pair of scissors while you're working around fabric... It sucks. I mean, a dull pair of scissors anywhere sucks. Don't get me wrong. But specifically, yeah. if you're trying to make somewhat nice cuts or trying to get into fine places, you'll find a pair of scissors that just work good for you. Just leave them with your sewing stuff. Scissors are not expensive. Just no. Pick... So since you kind of pulled one out, I'm going to pull. <laughs> just, I mean, I picked this up at Superstore. I think I got mine and, at Michael's. Uh, yeah, this one. I don't know if it came with the scissors, if they ended up in there, but there's a set of scissors with it, you know, uh, safety pins, um, just straight pins, and a bunch of threads and stuff. And then I took some stuff that I already had and threw in there. Um, yeah, I mean, you're going to need it. You're going to need some thread. You're going to need some pins and stuff. And uh, the other thing I try to keep in there is a good marker, something that I can mark the material with. Basically, I put where I would like the stitches to be, and I try to stay on that line. <laughs> and that, that honestly that? does help. Uh, I know a lot of people just freeball it. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to eyeball that. But if you make a line and follow it, your stitching does come out significantly nicer. Because I have done both. <laughs> you can get, like, a soap. I'm pretty sure that's what my mother had. It looked like a soap marker. And you just run it in, and then when you run it through the washing machine, it just cleans itself off. So it's not an issue, but I'll use a Sharpie or whatever. I don't care if there's a mark on my stuff. <laughs> I use washable markers, literally. Just I stole the Meadow Lily's drawing set. If, if you knew where it was going to end up after I start using it, you're going to be like, yeah, <laughs> that's the cleanest thing that goes through it. Right? And refer to tip number one, sew it inside out. Nobody sees it anyway. Yeah. Hopefully. But yeah, uh, so, you know, line your things up. With that big blanket I did, the length I had to do it, I, I tried doing the straight pins. It became more of an issue. And I have the luck. If there's a way that you can nail two two pins together so that they're going to hit and break a needle, I will do it 100% of the time. <laughs> Red Bear said to have lots of uh, pins to keep your material together. And chalk is another uh, yeah, very common chalk. way a lot of people use uh, mark material. <laughs> Same thing, run through the washer and it comes out. And much like you with pins, I try them. And Red Bear, I do try to use the things to keep things together and make it neat. And I've seen videos where they just leave them in and they sew over them and everything goes great. The second I come near a pin, I hit it dead on with a needle and break it. Every time. <laughs> I think it's magic. And, and Red Bear's right. I've watched my aunt. His, his mother's an amazing uh, at sewing and she's done some amazing stuff. My mother, like we got a couple other aunts that we share and man, they can do it all day long and I don't think they ever hit one. Now my mother says she hits them occasionally. So but not, every I time, have the skill. Like, like, every that's... time I hit one, I, I don't know. I think it's just bad luck <laughs> bears, but anyway, uh, so some other things that you're going to want for your sewing kit. If you are inclined to get one, a couple things that I found that were really nice was a threader which is just a little steel tab and a loop on it that helps you thread the needle in the machine. Uh, as I age, my eyes aren't as good. I find the threaders just way easier and way less annoying than just trying to, you know, shoot it through or pulling the needle out, putting the thread through, trying to put the needle back in the machine. It's just way easier. And the other thing is a, um, I think they call them a, a, a seam, richer, seam ripper or stitch ripper. Uh, if you accidentally sew something you shouldn't have, which does happen quite often, often when i'm sewing uh it's just a little neater way of ripping those threads back out instead of cutting it out with a pair of scissors because if you cut it out with a pair of scissors you usually end up damaging the material around it a fair bit and i have done this and say la vie but if it's something i'm really trying to save like i have limited material or i do kind of worry about looks a little bit i'll go with the seam ripper or thread ripper or whatever the heck it's called and it just makes a way nicer job and generally you can save all the material around it 
Uh, and then you can do whatever. Like just today, I was fixing a hole in my shirt. And the common thing that I go is like under my arms. I have a bad habit of taking my shirts off by pulling on the sleeve. And I always separate the seams under the arms. So I run them through with a cross stitch. And I wasn't paying attention. And I ran it through with the cross stitch perfect. But I also sewed it to the back of the shirt. So I, you know, effectively <laughs> sewed up the armhole. Took a second. Had to try and rip the seams out uh, or the stitches out. Because I kind of wanted to save the shirt. You know what I mean? But that's that's why I recommend a seam ripper. And honestly, that's it. When it comes to thread, you can color match as one as much as you want or try to and get a good selection. You're never going to hit the colors dead on, or at least I never seem to. So I stock up on white and black. Because honestly, they will go with anything in a pinch. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, there is different types of thread. It's, it's, it's worth looking at it. There is one that's better for denim. There's ones that are... You know, different strengths is really what you're looking at, right? Try to find something that's somewhat similar strength as the material you're using. There's no point in using a very heavy industrial thread for a very light fabric and vice versa. Getting a very strong fabric and putting a, a light, weak thread through it just means that that's your weakest point then. And it'll fail there 100% of the time. And to go down that rabbit hole a little more, make sure that your machine can use said thread. I bought some really strong thread that was thin so I could use it with some material that was really strong and thin, but my machine did not like it because it was too stiff and I ended up once again breaking needles constantly. Yeah, yeah, I've had, I've had similar issues. I had a, um, somebody do, that did um, upholstery give me a, a massive amount, and I do mean a massive amount, of upholstery thread he didn't need. and. Uh, it's more finicky to use for sure. It's, it's a little stiffer, a little harder. And if you get it going, it's going great. But if it ever balls up, forget it. Like you might as well just take the needle and toss it. <laughs> and I mean, you, your needles don't always break. Sometimes they'll hit the bottom of the steel and they'll just get dull. Yeah. And that causes you massive problems too. And I guess that's some of the learning curve with a sewing machine. If something doesn't seem like it's working smoothly, something has gone wrong. Yeah. <laughs> It could it be one of a well. million things, but something has gone wrong. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, that's some of the stuff for sure, yeah. So, like you said, repairing uh, material. I've One of the things I want to do is my winter tent does not have um, snow skirt. And I think that would be really helpful for what I do. And so I want to get some material and I want to just sew eight inch or nine inch snow skirts all the way around it. So I just need to get some more material and do that. And that's the beauty. If you have a sewing machine, you can, you can lay it out. Um, iron. There's, there's what we have not spoke of. Ironing your material before you're sewing is very useful. If you want to seam, iron the seam into it. And then sew to that as a line it helps too. Right? Mm. You can sew two pieces fold two pieces over, link them together, run the seam up helps too. So proper use of an iron helps. No, most yeah. definitely. Uh, anytime, like the odd time I try to hem pants, definitely uh, using so, the iron on them. Because then you yeah. can kind of iron the, the where you want it to stop into it. You can try the pants on and make sure it looks okay. Because everybody says, oh, you have a sewing machine. You can hem a pair of pants for me. It's not that simple. Maybe for somebody it is, but I always get it so it's always awkwardly hemmed. Like, it's not level at all. It kind of looks like Frankenstein's monster's pair of pants at the bottom. <laughs> so, I mean... <laughs> Shorter one side than the other? Every time. I mean, if you send me a pair of pants to hem, ne you're never wearing those pants to a fancy function, that's for sure. Like, <laughs> maybe a closed casket funeral. <laughs> <laughs> you put it in the washroom. That's about it. Walmart. Mm. <laughs> but I mean, that's also... I suppose if I wanted to teach myself to hem, I really could. But it's not what I want to do with my sewing machine. I didn't buy it for sewing things like that. I literally bought it for making stuff for bushcrafting. It is solely the reason I bought it. Uh, like I said, I do fix some clothes around the house. But very basically, I fix seams. If it rips on the seam, I'm your guy. If it didn't rip on a seam, take it somewhere else. I can fix basic toys for my dog and my kid because they don't care how it looks at the end of the day. 
And that's pretty much my level. And that's the best thing about this is that can be your level. Uh, or you can get into it a little more. And there is tons of information out there on YouTube and Google and whatever search engine or, you know, your choice on this stuff. There's tons of free information on the internet that will teach you how to do a ton of things with a sewing machine. You don't have to limit it to just doing your bushcrafting stuff. It can literally sew you clothes and all that stuff. And if you want to be more independent and more self-reliant, that is another great thing for it. What I will say, though is if your wife or your significant other uh, happens to be a sewer, you may not want to use their machine for doing your bushcrafting stuff. You still may want to look into getting your own. Not saying not to ask. Judge accordingly. <laughs> but you will find that bushcrafting materials tend to be a little harder on sewing machines, and you are going to be breaking those needles more often and things like that. And sometimes people don't like that when they have a sewing machine that they do exclusively use it for quilting or sewing finer materials and things like that. They kind of want it to stay in the shape for doing those finer things. Yeah. So now is when you hit on to those marketplaces and check uh, the buy, sell, trade sites and look for the big box deal sales and see if you can nab yourself a fairly good, decent priced one that's going to do exactly what you want it to. And the big thing, like Ben said, and I can't stress it enough, is make sure it's going to go through as thick a material as you want it to because that's the number one thing that everybody always shorts themselves on. And I'm no exception. Um, yeah, I think those are the big things, you know, figure out what you're going to do, do some research before you buy one, if you can. I mean, if you happen to be at value village and there's a beautiful looking sewing machine there, maybe you don't have time, but honestly, it only takes a few minutes to look it up and see, you know, what are the specs? What do they recommend? What do they not recommend? What do they say about it? The other thing is servicing. Sewing machines do need to be serviced. Um, and so every now and then they need a bit of oil, they need a bit of care. Maybe you need to bring them in and get them serviced. Um, do remember to do that because if you don't, over time they'll wear out quicker and you'll have more problems, you'll get more frustrated. And I, what I find is once you get frustrated to a certain point, you stop trying. Mm. So be aware of that. That there is, you know, there is a, a maintenance cycle to them. It's like any machine. It's any tool. Most tools have maintenance that has to be up kept so that, kept so that tool performs the way you expect it to. Yeah. And it doesn't take much to look it up. Like you said, YouTube is an amazing thing. You can look it up. They'll pretty well teach you how to do it if you you look up the right machine and stuff. Um, and a lot of the machines are pretty common. Like Singer is a, a big name, been around forever. Uh, Janome has been around a long time. Kenmore, I don't know. How many people must have grown up with Kenmore machines? Oh, man. Uh, Shark is another big one. That's what I own now. But they're honestly all function very similarly. Maybe not identical, but very similarly. So, I mean, my Shark is a clone of a singer, in all honesty. And I'm, and I'm not, hopefully Shark doesn't come after me and Singer doesn't come after me. But you put those two things side by side, they function identical. So. <laughs> <clears throat> the other one that I've seen a lot that I've never, I don't have much experience with is... Uh, Call it. I'm trying to look it up, see if I. Dilfer, Lilfer. I guess, uh, regardless of the brand name, uh, like Ben said, do a little research, do some reviews, uh, check them out, see what people are saying about them. And what I like to do when I'm looking at reviews is look at the best and the worst. And that kind of gives you a true indication of what's in between. Because a lot of the worst ones, they're user error. Or more often than not, a lot of the lower rated ones are user error or something that the user themselves did not take into account that was clearly labeled on the piece of machinery. Uh, and my, on you know the flip side of that, a lot of the higher end ones are just great product, five stars, and tell you nothing. So it's kind of somewhere jaded if you see something that's like, oh, that's 4.8 stars out of 10 reviews, and seven of them are just, you know, great product, five stars. Is that true? Is it not true? I really prefer the people that go into depth and give a little bit more insight to it. And you can kind of do that if you read enough, you know, you take a sampling of the worst and the best, and then you kind of fall somewhere in between for a true representation of the product. Still looking up that brand name? No. Okay. <laughs> Distracted. Rabbit hole. Brothers, another one that comes up. I'm just trying. 
yeah. There's there's a lot of good ones out there. You know, don't don't get stuck with the, the brand name too much, but do look it up, look and see what the specs are. Um, will it do what you want? Is it designed for it? Because they are designed for specific purposes. So just try to get them. Uh, for most of what we want to do, we're looking for probably just a general purpose one. Yep. Um, maybe a little heavier duty if you can get it. Because like you said, we're, most bushcraft stuff is using heavier duty materials. The exceptions, of course, might fall along some of the ultralight stuff. But when you get into some of that, like the Cuban fiber that was really popular there for a while, and I think it still is, you don't sew that. You There's, there's a tape you use on mm. that right so you buy the tape you cut it to shape and you put it on uh similar with tyvek uh some people are using that as like a poor man's cuban fiber you know go to the local construction site and steal a few feet of this <laughs> you can make a great ground sheet or something like that it's relatively lightweight throw it in a drying machine with some tennis balls and, and your favorite shoes and that'll beat it soft so it doesn't sound like tin flapping in the wind more or and, less. Uh, uh, something that Red Bear Tactical said here for things you might want to consider with your sewing machine, a large work area or table. And that is a good point. You do need a fair amount of room to work around a sewing machine, uh, especially when you get into like modifying your tarps and stuff like that. So don't expect to do it on like a laptop stand. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to work out. Like I've seen me have to put it down on the floor to stretch out some of the tarps and stuff in my kitchen. Uh, but a nice big table is definitely a huge plus on being able, if you have that kind of area. And a sturdy table um, makes a big difference. You're moving a lot of material around, plus that machine's vibrating a lot. And if you have it on something that has bounce, it really seems to affect the machine. So I've tried doing it on the plastic folding tables because it's the, the best one thing I had available. And it, it wasn't as good as if you put it on like a nice solid wooden table mm. that's not bouncing around. So... Yeah, a good work surface that has plenty of room to handle. You're trying to do a, a quilt or a blanket, you need room, 100%. Uh, and it's hard to do that in a small corner, wedged up against your keyboard and your and your monitor. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, no, for sure. Uh, and the last thing that I'm going to say, and this is just kind of a bonus one. You don't really need it, but it's a nicety. If you happen to see one that's on sale, it's worth picking up. Most sewing machines are going to come with foot pedals. 99% of them are single direction foot pedals. You push in on it, machine goes forward. There's usually a button on the machine you have to hold to make it go into reverse. So you can get a forward reverse pedal on some machines where you push it one way to go forward, one way to go in reverse. It is awesome when you can get them simply because you don't have to take both hands off the material you're working on. And you may ask, well, why is it important to send your material through forward and backwards? Because it locks your stitching in. So when you first yeah. start, roll it forward a little, back it up past where you originally started, and then go forward again, it's going to lock that in. So if you cut those off, like the threads off flush, and there's always going to be some thread left over from where you started and where you ended, if you cut those threads off, it's not going to unravel on you. You have to lock those stitches in. And there's nothing worse, especially when you're working around thicker materials, than having to take one hand off to put that reverse stitch in. Because now if it turns ever so slightly, you're not going over the stitch you already did. You're starting a whole new one off in another direction. And that does happen fairly often with me. Once again, not a professional sewer. I'm sure there's tricks to it, but it's something that I found with a rever uh, forward reverse pedal. You can still keep both hands on and it's really good. Now they're not super popular because what happens a lot of times is people accidentally push them in the wrong direction and they were sewing over their fingers and stuff like that. So they're kind of a rarity, but you can still find them. Who needs fingers? I mean, I got 10 of them. Yeah. Yeah, um, no, that's a good point. I never really thought of it. I don't have that, and I do have to hit that bar to go in reverse. And it is kind of like one of these timing things. But even with the regular pedal, just realize that you can not just step on it. Like It's like the throttle in your car. You can go half speed. You can go quarter speed. You can control that pretty good, right? Uh, so keep that in mind, because when you're get approaching to the end, if you just slow down a bit, you can push it. You can really control that. It, it does help. The other thing is when you start, keep your leads a little bit long and well behind the machine so they don't get tangled up in each other. Because if there's too, if they're too short, sometimes they tangle, and that had caused me a lot of issues over the years. Yep. Um, what else? Yeah. I don't know. It's kind of one of those things, the tips and tricks you learn as you go. 
I burn off my threads rather than cut them. Yeah, and I know a lot of people that do that too. Uh, melts them ever so slightly, and then they have way less chance of unraveling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, taking your time and just, you know, learn at it. Never hurts to just get a few cheap pieces of material and practice sewing. Um, ideally, before you start sewing, if you have a bit of extra material, to just get the tension and everything right. And there's, there's images you can look up online. They'll show you if you've got it too tight or too loose, and you know you know what it's right, it's right. Uh, but yeah, if you have extra material, you can actually spend some time to figure out what the settings for your sewing machine is and just practice it at. It doesn't hurt to just practice doing straight lines. You know, get a piece of material and run down it five, six, seven times, do parallel lines, and uh, it's going to help you later. Um, it's like everything. Practice, practice, practice. <clears throat> uh, Red Bear Tactical. Let me back up a little bit. Uh, but, but, uh, Matt Wosley, do you all take a small sewing kit with you into the bush for repairs? Red Bear. I have a small sewing kit in all my gear, even keep a small one in my wallet. Uh, and that's a good point. I always do have a small sewing kit with me. I usually keep it in my first aid kit. Uh, it consists of one button, a needle, uh, no, sorry, a couple needles, um, and just basically a junk of thread. Uh, I don't bother putting in different colors and stuff like that, but I do take a pretty good amount of uh, one color, usually black or white, like I said, whatever I have in bulk, and I'll spool it around a small stick, or um, honestly, it's the, a wooden Q-tip is what I use, and I just spool a whole bunch around that, and I stick uh, the needles down in beside it, jam it all inside a little pill bottle or something, um, or actually what I have is like little tubes from spices or something they're little plastic tubes no idea where i got them but anyway they fit the sewing kit perfect and i just drop it on my first aid kit uh and occasionally if it needs to i can kind of double purpose those if i disinfect them if i needed to throw a stitch in in a pinch you can use um <sighs> waxed but non-flavored floss will work in a pinch it's not great yeah. but it will work Floss actually is really good for sewing buttons in too, because it's generally silk and a lot stronger. Yeah. Um, actually, my aunt told me that. <laughs> and I believe um, that, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I usually have a sewing kit available. It can save you um, a lot of trouble. And if you can't, you will not imagine how much trouble until you have like uh, a strap pull out of a, t a backpack. And you're basically abandoned at that point. Like you can't carry a large backpack with one strap and you're just going to lose the other strap. It's all that's going to happen anyways. You won't make it far. Uh, if it was, but if you got a sewing kit, you can stitch that back on, you know, and it's one of those things where more stitches are better. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, uh, you know how they say, if you don't know how to tie knots, tie lots, it's kind of the same with stitching. If you're not really sure how to stitch, just do a lot of them. Yeah. Um, won't look but nice, yeah. but it'll get you through. <laughs> yeah. Same thing with ripped pants or ripped something. You can sew it up. It doesn't have to look pretty. It doesn't have to feel great. But just as long as it's together, it's going to really help you. Um, yeah. It's very useful. And Red Bear said a good thing there, too. Anybody that stays over at a hotel, generally they're going to have little sewing kits in the bathroom. They make great little kits to throw in your gear. Yeah. And just saying they're generally going to replace them regardless if you use them or not. A lot of hotels have the uh, the thing where they basically have to change everything after somebody's been there anyway for hygienic reasons. Because you never know if somebody uh, opened it, used the needle to pick their teeth or something and stuffed it back in, right? They can never guarantee that. So a lot of times they have to replace them anyway. So instead of them being thrown out, just saying, give it a new home. Yeah, yeah no, that's a good point. So yeah, yeah. Um... You know, sewing is a huge part of bushcrafting, in our opinion, um, and learning to do some, you know, basic stitches, um, you know, sew some material together. You can make some some pretty good gear. Uh, bags are a really good, good thing that, you know, come in handy to protect your gear and, and stuff. Um, you know, repair your gear. I've uh, I found it like. I made some pot or I got some pots. I didn't sew pots. Don't anyone get crazy there, but I got some pots and I made the, uh, the, the cozies for them. And they originally came with the little bags. When I make the cozies, now the bags don't fit. So now I'm planning on making a new bag just for it. So then I get my pot with the cozy on it. 
and have that little bit of extra room for a few things. So I like to throw a few things in my pot. Um, so again, you, you start off with product A and you end up with product B. The stove I bought came with a bag and I was very unsatisfied with it from the second I got it. And so it never actually got made it in the woods, not once. And I think... It was Is funny, that the one that ripped the... literally the day you opened it? Yeah, something ripped on it. Yeah, the, the bottom fell right out of the chimney bag from day one. Like... And it's funny, when I watched the review, everyone was like, oh, it comes with a nice sturdy bag. And I'm like, this year's that bag was not sturdy. so sturdy. Chris Jones just had a good point. I think this is actually where my tubes came from. Side note on hotels, some hotels have eyeglass repair kits, the ones in the little tubes. And I think that's exactly what my little sewn kit is. It's inside yeah. one of those little tubes. Because remember I said there were little tubes. I thought they were for spices or something. I think Chris hit it. I think it was an eyeglass repair uh, kit that I got from a truck stop or something. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I think we've covered a lot of this stuff. Yeah. You know? And like I said, it was just kind of a quick episode anyway. Uh, somebody asked a question about sewing machines, what they needed to get into it. So I figured, why don't we share it with everybody? Because we have mentioned it in the past, but we haven't really done an episode on it. So to, to summarize it, and, and there's one thing that we didn't necessarily mes- mention, buy decent thread. Uh, cheap thread will act like cheap thread, and you'll regret it 100% of the time. I've tried. Um, don't need to be the most fancy, complicated sewing machine in the world. In fact, I would recommend the more basic, the better. Make sure it's strong enough to go through the materials you're going through. Um, you'll always want spare needles. Um do the maintenance on it, learn some basic skills with it, practice with it. It's, it's fun. It can be entertaining. Uh, it's a great way to kill an evening. Um, and, uh, yeah. And honestly, like the accessories, like we both have like little sewing kits that we picked up at at, like Michael's. I don't think I spent a lot of money on that. Like the sewing machine, I spent money. Yeah. I just added to it. Yeah. But, uh, the accessories and stuff aren't that expensive. And like that blanket I made, a wool blanket with the, the waterproof backing, to buy something similar to that, I think I, just, I would end up spending way more than I spent on that. Well, a couple hundred bucks for that easy. And I bet you made it for under 100 or around there. 30? <laughs> I probably spent about 20 bucks on the vinyl, if, if maybe six, not 16 or something. I didn't spend a lot on it. And the the blanket itself I got at the thrift store, and I don't think I spent 10 bucks on it. Um, and maybe, maybe five bucks on thread, which I still have more than enough thread to do a dozen more. So, uh, so Red Sand Adventures, he has an old machine, uh, hoping to you put it to use to make an awning for the new truck camper. Uh, once yeah. again, Red Sand Adventures, another YouTuber there getting, uh, getting some new videos out there and they are a little bit more with the truck camping and stuff like that. So once you get that project completed, Red Sand, I'd love to see that. So you should shoot us a picture or at least give us a shout out on it. Uh, we've been kind of following you through your whole setup there. So we'd really like to see how it changes and kind of concludes. Uh, my parents, uh, my mother made with her, her little Kenmore sewing machine, which she used for 20 plus years. They bought a pop-up camper. When they bought it, the material was all rotten away. The canvas was shot. And so they re-sewed the entire thing. She did it all by herself, as far as I know. And uh, she just used that sewing machine. So you can do a ton of work. You don't need top-of-the-line machine by any means. But, yeah, get one. Learn the basic functions of it. Practice it. Like I said, get decent thread. Material you can pick up in thrift stores, any any craft store, Amazon. You know, lots of options out there for material. And, uh, yeah. Red Bear was just saying he'd uh, love to get one of the old manual foot machines. And frankly, when I was a kid, I used to work for an elderly lady, and that's what she had. Those things were amazing. Occasionally, I see them on the Facebook Marketplace uh, and auction sites. I so. see them on Facebook fairly regularly. Um, but yeah, when they get to the auction sites or if you go to antique places, uh, they seem to be asking a lot more for them. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, a friend of mine in Nova Scotia had mentioned they they were looking for one a while ago. I found a bunch 
on uh, you just have to be willing to go get them at the time. And I'm just going to quickly check and see. Uh, just here, sewing machine near me. And for $110, a classic sewing machine. Classic old singer. Not foot powered, but. I think Red Bear specifically looking for a foot powered one. Yeah. But anyway, you can still find them from there. Um, I can definitely keep eyes open, depending on how far you're willing to travel, Red Bear. I know you're not too, too far away, but far enough, you may not want to travel to another province. So, But we'll still keep an ear open. If I can track one down, maybe I can hide it somewhere and I can send it with uh, with Ben next time he's heading that direction. I'm not dragging him. Oh, you'll put that in your kit bag, bud. <laughs> oh, man. Here's uh, one. 120 bucks. Yeah, and that's the other thing. A lot of those foot-powered ones, they do require a special table. They usually fold up into the table. But... It's all there. Yeah, fine. Enough. But uh, anyway, we kind of digressed there a little bit. I think that's a good place to end the episode. We just kind of really want to get the point out there that sewing machines are definitely worth it. That was where the basic question came from. Are sewing machines worth it for bushcrafting? And what's the basic stuff you need to get going? And I think we pretty much uh, answered those two questions as well as gave some other ideas on what you can do with it. Um, both for bushcrafting, not bushcrafting, and a few tips and tricks that maybe weren't originally asked in the question, but we kind of gave them to you anyway to fill a little bit of time. Sound about right, Ben? Sounds about right. Yeah. PAF. P-H-A-F-F was the other brand I was looking for, and I found Paf. them. Sale. I haven't heard about them, but... They, they, they actually had a uh, sales outlet in Elmsdale when I was there, so they tried to tell me that was the best selling machine for me wasn't what i bought <laughs> fair enough but all right folks we'll see you again next week uh thanks for joining us get out there get dirty play safe and let us know about some of your adventures as always uh we do have a couple pictures that were sent into us i have them up on the uh the facebook page there scott mm -hmm. done a few projects and sent us some pictures and we love seeing that and if you send them in i'll be more than happy to put them up for you anyway night everybody night off <laughs>